The future is tricky to predict at the best of times, but during a period of an intense technological disruption, it becomes even more difficult. OPEC's oil and gas forever narrative, supported by modeling in the World Oil Outlook 2045 report, envisions a slow energy transition, with hydrocarbon demand strong well beyond mid-century. The International Energy Agency's announced policy scenario, a middle ground position for oil and gas consumption, forecasts weak petroleum demand by 2030, followed by decline a few years later. This is the fast transition model. The very fast transition model belongs to the Rocky Mountain Institute, which uses many of the same analytical tools used in this course. For RMI, the lower cost and higher efficiencies of clean energy technologies lead to exponential adoption rates. Global oil demand will peak before 2030, driven by rapid solar and EV adoption. OPEC's World Oil Outlook 2045 report very clearly lays out the assumptions behind its modeling of growing oil demand from 103 million barrels per day to 116 million barrels per day in 20 years. Here are three important assumptions. One, the clean energy technologies will not be economic anytime soon. Only rich countries that can afford subsidies will adopt clean energy. Two, emerging economies, especially those in the global south, will stick with oil and gas. This will be especially true for regions like Africa that have significant oil and gas reserves. Three, there is a waning global interest in climate and other policies that promote clean energy adoption. The evidence, however, shows that the shift is actually to more aggressive industrial policies that try to build out both clean energy manufacturing and deployment. Africa, as most of you would know, has over 900 million of its 1.4 billion people living without access to any form of modern energy for cooking or domestic heating. These people use wood, sticks, cow dung, and other unhealthy sources of energy to cook and heat their homes, causing millions of deaths from respiratory illnesses, especially among infants, children, and the aged. As for electricity, which the developed world has come to take for granted, over 600 million Africans do not have access to it. It is these realities that inform the position of Africa on the energy transition. While climate activists have tried to encourage all countries, irrespective of the level of the socioeconomic development, to aggressively pursue net zero by proposing to provide financial support in the form of climate funds, the history of this country's redemption of previous commitments has left Africa doubtful if this time things are going to be different. OPEC's biggest mistake is underestimating China's role in scaling up clean energy manufacturing, driving down costs, and forcing the USA and the EU into a clean energy arms race. For example, OPEC models that China's oil demand will grow 4 million barrels per day by 2045, even though state-owned Sinopec has forecast peak oil demand for China arriving between 2026 and 2030. Another miscalculation is that China won't target emerging economies for clean energy exports, like solar panels and EVs, which it's already doing in a significant way. Cheap solar and EVs will likely limit growth of transportation-related oil demand and could even lead to declines in places like Latin America, Southeast Asia, and Africa. The vast overcapacity of China's clean energy factories is a strong indication that exports will continue to grow. OPEC's modeling relies too much on global south demand to think that the oil and gas forever worldview is the likely energy future. The International Energy Agency is respected for its high quality modeling, which includes the world's best energy economics data. There are basically three scenarios. Stated policies or steps, the status quo baseline, Announce Pledges or APS, and Net Zero. Energy transition experts consider the step scenario unlikely because the energy transition is moving too quickly. But it's not moving quickly enough to achieve Net Zero by 2050. That leaves the APS as the most likely scenario. But the APS is not good news for the fossil fuels industry. Demand for coal, oil, and natural gas is forecast to peak by 2030, and begin to decline in just a few years. 
Oil, for example, will be below 60 million barrels per day by mid-century. Oil exporting nations like the United States and Canada will feel the economic pain. Perhaps most importantly, the IEA pays close attention to China's role in the energy transition. For example, the IEA tracks global energy investment and finds that despite having substantial overcapacity in clean energy manufacturing, China intends to keep pace with American and European investment. This suggests that the clean energy arms race will only intensify in the future. We think that the IEA's announced policy scenario is the most likely energy future in 2050. CapEx, or capital expenditure, is destiny, according to Bloomberg's Nat Bullard. A great deal has to go right over the next 25 years to achieve a fast energy transition. While humans have many of the technologies needed to transition to clean electricity, there are serious constraints to their rapid deployment, such as shortages of equipment and qualified workers. Solutions must be found for hard to electrify sectors like steelmaking and long haul freight trucking. Modern power grids re-engineered to work with intermittent generation like wind and solar must be reliable and at least cost no more than the ones powered by coal and gas. These are just a few examples of numerous problems that must be solved. The global energy system is massive and complex, which leads to significant inertia that is difficult to overcome. Oil tankers really don't turn on a dime. According to Kings Mill Bond of the Rocky Mountain Institute, the most likely mid-century outcome is somewhere between the IEA's announced policies and net zero scenarios. Here are three reasons why RMI's view of the energy future may be correct. One, fossil fuels are incredibly inefficient and wasteful. Combusting oil and gas is only about 33% efficient, while electric technologies are well north of 70%. The higher efficiency leads to lower waste and costs. Two, as we have seen, manufacturing costs fall over time on learning curves. But RMI expects clean energy curves to fall even faster than the IEA does, whose forecasts have consistently underestimated the growth of solar, for example. Three, China's ambition to be a geopolitical superpower is bound up with leading the world in clean energy manufacturing and deployment. Everyone else, including the US and the EU, is chasing China. The amount of capital required, manufacturing capacity needed, and infrastructure to be built for a fast energy transition is staggering. If any country can muster these resources, it's China. If everything has to go just right to achieve the IEA's announced policy scenario, imagine the challenges for the RMI outlook. Already, the comparatively leisurely pace of change in North America suggests change may happen more slowly than RMI expects. Three reasons why RMI might be wrong. One, very few countries can successfully manage rapid system change. China's national government has the authority and the resources to direct change, but Western governments do not. They must build political support for clean energy industrial policies, a difficult task that can be reversed by newly elected governments. Two, building a new energy system is expensive. Bloomberg NEF estimates that $4.8 trillion per year is needed from 2024 to 2030 to achieve net zero by 2050. Last year, only $1.8 trillion was invested in clean energy. RMI's forecast is not quite a net zero one, but BNEF's estimate provides an idea of the magnitude of change required. Three, the global south has a very long way to go especially the less developed economies. Energy transition dilemmas are created when systems are disrupted, in many cases by new technologies, and difficult decisions are required. Who is responsible for making the decisions? Can they afford it? Do the decision makers even recognize the disruption in the first place? We shouldn't assume that the right answer is obvious to the decision makers, whether they be corporate managers, policymakers, or citizens. Nor should we assume that the decision makers even understand the change they are responding to. A prominent theme in modern energy transition stories is experts like oil and gas engineers who are convinced the future will be an extension of the past 
125 years in which petroleum played a large role. They simply don't have the analytical framework with which to understand the evidence and data before them. Ultimately, acknowledging energy transition dilemmas is about recognizing that individuals and communities don't always understand changes affecting them or make the right choices when responding to that change. 